Hi, Peter. Peter. Hi, Bob. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. And you? I'm doing fine. Let me introduce you. I'm Robert Wright of Blogging Heads TV. You are Peter Cornblue, the uh, director of, I guess, what, the Cuba Documentation Project at the National Security Archive? Is that that is correct. And the National Security Archive, I, I imagine sometimes when you utter that phrase to people, they think it means you work for the government, but it, it definitely doesn't, right? Do you want to tell people what the National Security Archive is? We are often mistaken for the library of the Central Intelligence Agency or uh, uh, a part of the National Security Agency, which we unfortunately share initials with. But we are the antithesis of both of these secretive government agencies. We are mm -hmm. a, a nonprofit, a research center specializing in declassified documentation and pushing the U.S. government to release the secrets of history and the secrets of foreign policy so that we can have a full and informed democratic debate over what our government is doing in our name, but so often without our knowledge. Okay. And you've uh, been involved in the release of a number of documents related to the Cuba Missile Crisis, whose 50th anniversary is upon us even as we speak. I guess, I guess the anniversary will climax kind of on October 27th. Is that right? I mean, it was a, it was a crisis of some duration, but isn't that, doesn't that have a name, Black Saturday or something? Well, Black Saturday is the, uh, uh, the 50th anniversary of the most dangerous day Mm -hmm. uh, in the history of mankind, um, but it was one of the uh, known 13 days of the Cuban Missile Crisis, starting on October 16th, uh, when John Kennedy is informed by the CIA that they had found photographic intelligence uh, ballistic missiles in Cuba, and culminating on the 28th of October when from behind the scenes negotiations, the Soviets finally agree publicly to withdraw those missiles. So we're in the midst now of uh, these day-by-day uh, -day 50th anniversaries of the missile crisis. Um, there'll be a lot of coverage on the 22nd of October. Uh, that was the day when John Kennedy went public with his knowledge, announced to the nation, to the world, and to the Soviets that he knew those missiles were there and this is what he planned to do about them create a naval quarantine around Cuba to intercept any Soviet ships carrying military equipment to Cuba and buy some time for the Soviet unions to meet his demand that those missiles be withdrawn. Mm -hmm. And why do you call the 27th the most dangerous day, what did you say, in the history of humankind or something? Well, of the 13 days of the crisis, the 27th of October, which is known as Black Saturday, was the day in which so many things started to go wrong, uh, confrontations on the high seas, the shoot down of a U-2 plane by a Soviet uh, uh, anti-aircraft battery in Cuba, um, another U-2 spy plane of the United States straying into Soviet airspace and the Soviets believing this was a prelude to an attack on the Soviet Union, a public mm -hmm. demand by Nikita Khrushchev um, for uh, swapping uh, U.S. missiles in Turkey for the Cuban missiles uh, that he had put on the island. Uh, and, and dramatically, as I mentioned, on the high seas, a U.S. destroyer dropping depth charges on a Soviet submarine, not knowing that that submarine carried a nuclear tipped torpedo and that the captain had orders to fire his weapons rather than surface and surrender. It's only by a miracle that he decided in the end not to fire his weapons uh, and, and came up. Um, so it was a day in which both Nikita Khrushchev in Moscow and John Kennedy in Washington realized that there were things happening that they could no longer control. Um, they both accelerated their efforts to find a deal. The public deal, which was announced the next day, was that the United States uh, would uh, make a kind of a public commitment not to invade Cuba in the future, uh, mm -hmm. and the Soviets would agree to withdraw the missiles which they had ostensibly put in to protect Cuba from the U.S. invasion. That was the public deal. The secret deal, however, that really sealed the deal, if you will, uh, ending the most dangerous crisis in human history was John Kennedy's secret commitment to the Soviets to withdraw those U.S. missiles in Turkey. Uh, mm -hmm. in return for the missiles in, in Cuba. And that deal 
was made orally, not on paper, by Robert Kennedy to the Soviet ambassador to Washington, Anatoly Dobrynin, late the night of October 27th. Okay, and that was not known for another, I don't know, 16 or 18 years. That It did not become public that our withdrawal of missiles from Turkey had been part of the deal. The quid pro quo did not become public uh, for decades thereafter, and instead the American public and the international community was left with this impression that John Kennedy with uh, cojones de hierro, you know, balls of steel, had stood firm uh, and... Uh, the Soviets had backed down from this gamble that they had uh, put in place. There was this iconic statement during the crisis uh, when U.S. officials thought that Soviet ships were approaching the quarantine line and that they had stopped and turned around. Um, mm -hmm. And it was a statement that was made and caught on a secret taping system that Kennedy had by Secretary of State Dean Rusk. He said, we were eyeball to eyeball and the other guy just blinked. Mm -hmm. And that was the image of the resolution of the crisis, that we, you know, played a game of chicken with the Soviets, and they were the ones that uh, swerved and retreated. The truth of the matter is that it was a accommodation, a negotiation, uh, a, a compromise to end the crisis. And it's really only now, 50 years later, that people are considering what the real lesson of the resolution of this crisis was. The image of John Kennedy has gone from a resolute president to a resolution president, somebody who really was committed to avoiding attacking Cuba for fear that that would escalate into a nuclear war, um, and really dedicated to finding a, a, a behind-the-scenes way to let the Soviets save face, give them something they needed and wanted to get those missiles the hell out of Cuba. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you very uh, recently, I think, were part of a, well, were, you were part of a recently successful effort, I think, to, uh, to, to, to make public some of the Bobby Kennedy documents that are relevant to this, right? The family of Robert Kennedy, uh, Ethel uh, Kennedy, his wife, and, uh, and his, his, uh, his grown children, um, agreed uh, to let their father's personal papers relating to the missile crisis be made uh, public on the 50th mm -hmm. anniversary. We owe them a debt of gratitude for that. Uh, it's something that uh, my organization and other historians have hoped for, been pushing for, for a number of years because Robert Kennedy was a fundamental key player uh, in the Cuban Missile Crisis. He was... Was he a moderating influence? Well, he, you know, he was a he was his brother's alter ego in some ways, and uh, he, in the beginning of the crisis, uh, was in some ways uh, for a forceful response. But as he realized over the course of time that his brother was really dedicated to not taking the risk of attacking Cuba mm -hmm. and risking a Soviet risking killing thousands of Soviet personnel on the island and risking the Soviets retaliating by either firing missiles at the United States or invading Berlin uh, and attacking U.S. bases there, uh, etc. Um, Robert Kennedy, of course, became a, a person that was his most, uh, that was the president's most trusted confidant, his chief advisor, and his secret intermediary to the Soviets uh, to resolve this crisis. So getting his papers, since he was literally in some ways the deputy president at that time during the worst crisis of the Kennedy administration and of, of contemporary history. Um, getting his papers was fundamental to, to fully understanding uh, the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis and its lessons. Okay, and you're just now starting to go over that material or? I had the, great, you... I had the great honor of being uh, the first person in line to see those papers when they were released uh, a week ago, Wednesday. Um, uh, hold them in my hand, the original mimeos, some of Robert Kennedy's handwritten notes during the secret meetings with his brother and his brother's senior team of national security advisors during the crisis. Um, I was able to go through the boxes that contain the documents on the missile crisis. There are a number of other boxes that have been released, but Robert Kennedy's involvement in overseeing covert operations in Cuba in the early 1960s, um, his efforts to get Bay of Pigs prisoners freed, um, the post-mortem on the Bay of Pigs, 
Um, and uh, the missile crisis papers are, are, are really uh, quite interesting. They don't change our fundamental understanding of what happened, um, although we have learned, I should point out, from these papers more about one of the most secret parts of Kennedy's commitment to, to, uh, to diplomacy during the missile crisis, and that is uh, his authorization and implementation of a secret approach to Fidel Castro during the missile crisis in an effort to see if he would uh, take a deal with the United States, kick out the Soviets, kick out their missiles, and the United States and the uh, Latin American community would accept his revolution and, and learn to live with it. Um, so we've learned a little bit more about that from the papers, but it's really important to have them. Frankly, let me tell you, Bob, the Cuban Missile Crisis is so important and the lessons of it are so important that we should have every single scrap of paper from every country that was involved in the crisis so that we could really know what happened and learn the lessons of history. Okay. Was, was that message actually, that overture actually delivered to Castro? It was delivered to Castro. It was a, an amazingly creative uh, and complicated initiative in which the United States government, uh, the Kennedy's office, sent a secret message to Castro. They sent it through a Brazilian, uh, the Brazilian government as an intermediary, and indeed they asked the Brazilian government of João Goulart, who was a leftist populist president of the biggest country in Latin America and had very good relations with Castro. Uh, they sent this message as if it was a message from Goulart uh, and the Brazilian government mm -hmm. to Castro. The, Cable, the secret cable, which is now posted on the website of my organization, the National Security Archive, um, went to Brazil. Uh, it, from there, it was carried by a special emissary to Cuba. It was delivered to Fidel, but because of the time it took to, to arrange all this and, and actually implement it physically, uh, by the time he got the message, it was um, a few hours after the Soviets had uh, uh, announced they were withdrawing the missiles, and his attention was now focused on having been betrayed by his ally uh, that he had been willing to sacrifice his country for. So he wasn't really much in a mood for, for this idea, although I should point out that over the course of the next year, um, uh, uh, 18 months or so, the United States did continue to explore exactly the deal that they proposed to him in that message. Coexistence, peaceful modus vivendi with the Cuban Revolution if Castro cut his ties with the Soviet Union. And he rejected that. Well, you know, the, the whole discussion was coming to fruition literally on November 22nd, 1963, when John Kennedy had an emissary meeting with Fidel Castro, offering him this arrangement once again in a much more direct form. And the news came in that the President of the United States had been assassinated in Dallas. And Fidel Castro turned to Kennedy's emissary, who was a French journalist named Jean Daniel, and says, and said, there goes your mission of peace. And Daniel actually agreed. You know, if I did not have President Kennedy to take back Fidel's response to, then I had no mission. So the initiative did not survive the transition to the Johnson administration? It did not. Do we, do we know why? Did anybody try? Oh, yes, and uh, I have to tell you that the full story of Kennedy's initiative, secret initiative with Castro, and how this did kind of move into the Johnson era, uh, uh, and, and, and quite a few interesting things happened in the first year of the Johnson administration as well. This story is told in a forthcoming book that I'm the co-author of called Talking with Fidel, the Untold History of Dialogue Between the United States and Cuba. Okay. Good. Um... A anything you want to say about that now, about the, uh, or do you want to, is it too long a story, or would you rather save, save your thunder for... Uh, I'd rather, uh, I'd rather people book. read the book when it comes out. Okay. Um, but I should say that this episode, starting with the Cuban Missile Crisis and uh, uh, moving forward, um, is part of a, a rich history of uh, the United States and Cuba secretly trying to find some common ground in which to normalize relations. Fifty years have gone by since the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, mm -hmm. and one of the key lessons that we have learned, which is relevant not only to the discussion of Cuba today, uh, but also the discussion of uh, what to do about uh, Iran and whether you know there's going to be a preemptive strike there, um, the key lesson is that small countries will defend themselves if they feel threatened.
and Cuba felt threatened, um, legitimately so, because Kennedy had authorized the invasion at the Bay of Pigs. Uh, he and his brother had then authorized and overseen Operation Mongoose in the wake of the failure of the Bay of Pigs. And it was clear to Castro at the time that uh, he was going to need some kind of deterrent from a U.S. attack, and he thought that Soviet nuclear missiles uh, would do the trick. Um, and uh, in the end, uh, we have this lesson. Uh, Cuba still feels threatened, um, and there's no threat to the United States anymore. There's really no reason why we can't have normal relations with Cuba at this point. The Soviet Union no longer exists. Obviously, Cuba's not going to be a nuclear base for anybody. Uh, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, Castro is old and infirm now. There's even rumors that he's in very serious poor health at this very moment. Um, his brother is leading the country slowly but somewhat steadily to a transition towards a far less strict socialist economy. Cuba's changing, um, but U.S. policy literally remains stuck uh, in the early 60s in which the circumstances were created to have a Cuban Missile Crisis and to have this you know, extraordinarily abnormal relationship with, with Cuba, which now only we have. The rest of the world has perfectly normal relations. Uh, with, the, mm -hmm. with the Castro Revolution. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned this uh, this failed initiative to to uh, draw Cuba into our orbit and get them to cut their ties with the Soviets. You know, an intermediate path, I guess, would have been not to insist that they cut their ties with the Soviets, but to seek economic engagement, the idea being that we could maybe wean them off of the, the Soviet dependency. Um, that's that's another path that was also not pursued, right? Um, well, you have to remember that it was John Kennedy himself who imposed the trade embargo uh, in uh, 1962 as kind of a result of, um, of the failure of the Bay of Pigs and wanting to strike out at, at Cuba. So Cuba had not even had an opportunity to fully reorient its economy towards the Soviet Union when these talks between Kennedy and Castro, these secret back channel gestures and feelers uh, meetings were taking place. Uh, but, um, of course, over the course of time, the Cuban economy did shift to um, being very integrated with the Soviet Union. Um, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, Cuba has branched out with other trading partners, China, Venezuela in particular. Um, they don't really need uh, the uh, economic relationship with uh, the United States. But I think precisely my point being about the lesson that small countries will seek to defend themselves Cuba does feel a continuing national security threat from the United States as long as there is a trade embargo in place and as long as it's the kind of open st stated you know, policy of the United States to push for regime change uh, in Cuba. Um, and yeah. so uh, we do have a situation where really normal relations probably would um, uh, highlight and it escalate any kind of reform in Cuba uh, because it would take away the issue of the national security threat and, and how that threat is mm -hmm. used inside Cuba by the intelligence ministry and the military to uh, keep a strong hold over the country. Yeah. Well, you mentioned the parallel with Iran today, and I, I guess there is one, because I don't, I don't know that our stated policy is one of regime change in Iran, but I think it is the perception of some people in the Iranian government that that is our goal, right? Uh, certainly, uh, that is their perception. Uh, they uh, see uh, Israel as a surrogate for the United States. Um, they remember uh, much more vividly than any American the fact that the CIA overthrew uh, uh, one of their leaders in the 1950s and installed the Shah of mm -hmm. Iran, um, uh, etc. The new movie Argo that's out with Ben Affleck kind of goes over this ground uh, and mm -hmm. I think in a really interesting way politically uh, reminds Americans of what our history in Iran uh, was. Um, and today, of course, you have a situation where Iran does uh, feel uh, threatened um, and uh, it's not clear what their nuclear program really uh, is at the moment. But the point that I think analysts in Washington are making today is that if you do a preemptive strike against Iran, and I should mention that Benjamin Netanyahu invoked Kennedy in the Cuban Missile Crisis when he came uh, to the United Nations and drew his red line. He said, you know, the United States should draw a red line today just like John Kennedy drew a red line during the Missile Crisis. His point was to promote a preemptive strike, but 
Kennedy avoided a preemptive strike because he knew it would endanger the future of the entire world in the nuclear age. And his aides at the time understood that he was trying to avoid attacking Cuba. There's this one famous passage that was caught on tape of Robert McNamara the very first day of the crisis, October 16th, and they're discussing a surprise attack on Cuba. And he says very poignantly and with great concern, he says, I don't know what kind of world we will live in after we attack Cuba. I don't think we've quite talked about the consequences after we've struck Cuba with 500, you know, bombs. We don't know what will happen next. And his point being is, what will the Soviets do? He thought that we would probably kill about 800 or so, 400 to 800 Soviet personnel on the island of Cuba. The CIA, just so you understand intelligence failures going all the way back, told Kennedy that there were 8,000 Soviet personnel in Cuba with these missiles. The truth was that there was 42,800 Soviet engineers, soldiers, generals on that island. And you can imagine a week of carpet bombing and then an invasion of Cuba, how many of them would have been killed and, you know, if Khrushchev hadn't responded militarily violently, everybody predicted that he probably would. So it was a very dangerous moment. And what people are saying today is you create even more danger if you attack Iran. As threatening as it may seem, it is likely to escalate their commitment towards a nuclear program in the future if you attack them today. So... Well, the other parallel is that Kennedy decided to find out what sort of concession he could make that was considered very important by the Soviet Union. It turned out to be take your missiles out of Turkey, which we did secretly in concession. I guess the analogy with Iran would probably be letting them to keep enriching uranium at a low level. I mean, that seems to be the one thing that they are insisting on and that Israel is not enthusiastic about and not many American officials are publicly enthusiastic about. Sure, nobody's enthusiastic about that situation. Everybody understands that the Middle East is a dangerous place. People are worried about proliferation in other Middle Eastern countries as well as Iran. But it's not at all clear that using violence, attacking Iran, killing Iranians is going to do anything but fully inflame the situation and make the future for all of us more dangerous. So there is back channel diplomacy going on, I'm sure, with Iran and there's public diplomacy. One of the deans of scholarship on the Cuban Missile Crisis, Graham Allison, was just at the Kennedy Library this past Sunday. I was there, too, for a nice, interesting public forum on the eve of the anniversary of the crisis. And he pointed out that Iran is like a slow motion missile crisis, Cuban Missile Crisis, because it's playing out over a period of months and even years. But the other lesson from the Cuban Missile Crisis is at the time that Kennedy had, first secretly when he first found out about the missiles, to kind of consider his options for five days without anybody knowing, without the Soviets knowing that he knew, without the American public, the American Congress, the American press knowing that he knew. And then taking the option not of attacking Cuba, but of creating a quarantine around Cuba and buying time for further diplomacy. This time, as he himself put it in his own thoughts after the crisis, gave him the possibility of coming up with a solution. And that is yet another kind of lesson, process lesson, if you will, of this crisis management example that we have. And hopefully, because there is time on Iran, there is time to finally arrive at some point at some kind of compromise that certainly allows the Iranians to have a sense of their own security, protect themselves, feel protected, and us avoiding the threat that we are so concerned about. So I guess you agree then with this, there was a Leslie Gelb piece in Foreign Policy arguing that the mythology surrounding the Cuban Missile Crisis, that is the idea that Kennedy just stared down 
the Soviets, you know, the, the, the version of the story that doesn't include Kennedy secretly agreeing to take our missiles out of Turkey. Um, Gelb argued that that mythology has been damaging to America's national security uh, by discouraging people, I guess, in a variety of situations from seeking uh, a, a, a diplomatic solution to things. Do you, do you think it has been? I mean, it kind of surprised me when I read that because I just had not seen uh, the, the crisis explicitly invoked in that way myself. But do you think it really, the mythology of it has had a damaging legacy in some broad sense? I am fully in agreement with Wesley Galb. I wrote uh, a similar conclusion that's posted on the website of Cigar Aficionado of all places. I wrote a 50th anniversary piece for them. Uh, they have so far posted kind of the last half of the piece, which deals with the secret approach to Castro and the lessons from the crisis. And I, I point out that the lessons from the crisis, uh, just like Gelb argued, um, uh, were not the initial lessons. Um, the, the mythical lessons were created out of secrecy uh, and the president's need to spin his own accomplishments and his aides then writing memoirs that lauded his terrific, his, what, what, what Arthur Schlesinger called his calibrated response, his, you know, his nerve and wisdom, um, and uh, all built around this iconic, we were eyeball to eyeball, and the other guy just blinked. And the truth of the matter mm -hmm. was is that we both blinked, and rightfully so, because two leaders were facing having the power to press the button and unleash mm -hmm. uh, nuclear Armageddon and essentially the end of the world as we, as we understood it. And mm -hmm. they both blinked uh, because they were uh, leaders that had inadvertently gotten themselves into this position. Kennedy had started the ball rolling on the Cuban Missile Crisis by authorizing the CIA and the U.S. military to launch a paramilitary invasion on Cuba in April of 1961. And then when that failed, authorizing a massive set of covert operations to try and overthrow Castro, known as Operation Mongoose. Sabotage, assassination plots, economic, um, economic um, uh, destabilization, uh, diplomatic isolation, all part of Mongoose, all part of trying to overthrow Castro. Um, and he'd given Castro every, every incentive that he needed to, to want to defend himself and to accept the Soviet proposal a year later of putting nuclear weapons, weapons in Cuba as a deterrent. So he really was mm -hmm. responsible for creating the circumstances under which this happened. Of course, Nikita Khrushchev, uh, who was very kind of vexed and, and unhappy about having Tur U.S. missiles in Turkey on his own border and in Italy, pointed at the Soviet Union. Um, and wanted to kind of create a similar set of circumstances for the United States to have to live with. Um, uh, he uh, was part of this equation by taking the extraordinary risky gamble of trying to secretly put these missiles into Cuba. He could have openly put them into Cuba and dealt with all the resistance of the United States. He had the same rights to put them into Cuba as the United States had to put missiles in Turkey. Um, but he tried to do it secretly. Mm -hmm. And then once he was caught, these circumstances were created in which, as he wrote to Kennedy, both leaders had tied a knot and they were tightening the knot and they better act quickly to loosen and unravel the knot before it was too tight to undo. He literally wrote that to Kennedy during the crisis. Uh, so mm -hmm. uh, it was important that they found a way uh, to, mm -hmm. uh, to, to get out of it. But, you know, what happened, of course, is that the compromise was kept secret. Uh, and the wrong lessons were learned. And instead, in right. Vietnam and in other uh, confrontations around the world, uh, the idea was that if you stood firm, showed balls of steel, were a real man about it, the United States would somehow prevail. Um, and you can imagine if for the last 50 years, the lesson of the most dangerous episode uh, in foreign policy history had been that compromise, negotiation, creative diplomacy, is really the way we save ourselves. You can imagine things might have been different. A lot more people might be alive today. Right. And then if every time someone accused you of doing a Munich, then you could have said, <laughs> replied by, I want to do a Cuba. And That's exactly, you know, but... exactly the point that we are all making <laughs> on the 50th anniversary. It's a crime 
that the history has been kept secret for so many years and the lessons not really aired until now, but it is great that this anniversary is being used to air precisely the kinds of arguments that Leslie Galb and I and Michael Dobbs and, and, and many others are, are now making uh, publicly because this is so very, very, very important for our future. So, uh, do you think Kennedy could have afforded politically to pull the deal off if it had had to be public um, that he was uh, that he was um, just a second, excuse me, that, that he was uh, that he was removing the mi the missiles from Turkey? Could 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 Kennedy have pulled that off in terms of the domestic politics? Well, let me tell you how committed John Kennedy was to, to pulling that very option off. He um, told his brother, go talk to Dobrynin, offer him the public plan, but then privately say that secretly he has my commitment to pull out these missiles. I'll never admit that I made a quid pro quo with him. With nothing's going to be put on paper. He's just going to have to trust me. But Kennedy was not sure that Khrushchev would accept the deal secretly, that Khrushchev would trust him. Uh, and mm -hmm. go ahead and accept this deal. So he implemented later that night Plan B, which was to have Secretary of State Dean Rusk send a secret message through an intermediary to the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, who thought, um, and the message was, if we need you to do this, this is what we want you to do. We want you, the United Nations, to announce your own plan to resolve this crisis that the Soviets pull mm -hmm. the missiles out of Cuba and that the United States reciprocate by pulling the missiles out of Turkey. If you announce this as a UN initiative, that will give me the political cover to agree. And I tell you now that I will agree to that deal. I cannot uh, announce and propose that deal publicly myself, but if you do it, I will sign on and we will hope that Khrushchev will sign on also. So. He was committed to finding a way to do this. Uh, and that commitment, I think, is something that hasn't been fully incorporated into the study and lessons of the missile crisis. Uh, it's been hard to break through the mythology uh, that was created around this uh, model of crisis management, this resolute president standing firm and forcing the Soviets to retreat. The Soviets did not retreat. They got something they wanted and needed. Uh, the United States got something um, that we wanted and needed. Uh, it wasn't that the United States won and the Soviets lost. Let me tell you, we all mm -hmm. won with this resolution at the mm -hmm. Cuban Missile Crisis. Well, this is, the, uh, it seems to me, such a common failure uh, to appreciate that so many times these things are actually non-zero-sum games. Yeah. And, and that's the irony, is that the, the domestic politics of it kind of dictate that the leader depict it as a zero-sum game that, that you won, right? That, that's why Kennedy didn't want it known that he had made the concession about uh, missiles. You know, you have, to, you have to be able to turn to your people and say, we beat them this time. When in fact, it's, it's usually not a zero-sum game, and that's just a mischaracterization. Well, this, is why, this is why it's so tragic that we lost this opportunity to kind of reconfigure the, the whole sensibility about the United States and its foreign policy. Um, we don't have to ha have a pejorative, negative, hostile sense of compromise and accommodation uh, with our adversaries. Mm -hmm. It is not that, mm -hmm. you know, winning and defeating our adversaries is so great and wonderful. It is that if you compromise and people are, lives are saved and the sanctity, security, integrity of our country is saved and the world is not destroyed, uh, uh, that itself should not be a negative thing. Um, and the missile crisis right. with the magnitude of it did have the potential if the lessons had been learned earlier. Uh, I understand and certainly accept that there should be secrecy around creating a deal in which this would work. But interestingly enough, the Kennedy White House went out of its way to keep this thing secret for years thereafter, even long after, long after Kennedy was killed and, uh, and the administration was no longer. There was still a cover-up of this 
uh, history. And the Soviets, interestingly enough, being the disciplined communists that they were, they had agreed to keep this thing secret, and they went ahead and kept it secret, even though the world thought that they had retreated and almost surrendered. Um, both of those things are kind of amazing to me. Uh, maybe the Soviet secrecy more so than the uh, cover up by the the uh, by Kennedy's allies. But but I, I, you know I don't I, I don't understand a very strong motivation to keep this secret long after the Kennedy administration had passed. I guess they thought that people would think of him as weaker. Uh, if, if we understood that he actually made a second concession aside from and that, and that's my point Cuba. that we missed the opportunity to change that sense of weakness in fact he was as strong as possible he I, I, I have to tell you Bob on the 27th of October that day we were talking about Khrushchev that very morning publicly announced on the radio that he was escalating his demands the day before he had privately sent a letter to Kennedy saying if you guarantee a no invasion of Cuba, then I can take those missiles out. But the next day, publicly mm -hmm. on the radio, he issued a second demand. We don't want to live with those missiles in Turkey anymore. You take them out, and I'll take the missiles out of Cuba. And U.S. officials in the White House, who hadn't slept, you know, in three or four days at this point, couldn't really understand what had happened. Uh, you listen to the tapes, and there's McNamara again saying, how can we negotiate with a guy who sends us a private proposal one day, and there's just a few hours changes it? Publicly, how do you negotiate with a guy like that? And Kennedy himself is heard on the tapes saying again and again and again, you know, from his point of view, that's a good proposal. And from the world's point of view, that probably seems like a decent, realistic, fair exchange as well. We're not going to look very good mm -hmm. if we reject it. And almost all of his mm -hmm. aides in the room, with the exception of, of Adelaide Stevenson, who'd been pushing all along for the Kennedy administration to offer to swap the missile bases and the missiles in Turkey for the missiles in Cuba. Um, all of his other aides say to him, you cannot take those missiles out of Turkey. It will look like it. Are, are they saying that because it would be a domestic uh, political debacle or what? What's the, no, they, they, made made they, made, they made that argument, but they made it more of a foreign policy argument. It will look like it, it's precisely what we're talking about. You'll look weak. It will, it will, Munich, Munich, it will look Munich. like you are yielding to nuclear blackmail. You will be hurting the NATO right. alliance because those missiles were put into Turkey under a NATO framework, and the Turks themselves will feel abandoned and betrayed as an ally. And let me pinpoint for you and your listeners and watchers, your audience, the most extraordinary moment of this entire 13 days. Kennedy is heard on tape thinking out loud, kind of looking down the road a week from now, and I wrote this in the Cigar Aficionado uh, article. Kennedy says to his aides, almost all of whom are universally against him doing this swap. He says, well, you know, it sounds good to reject this deal now, but I'm thinking down the road a week from now, after we've attacked Cuba. You know, we all know how everybody's courage flies out the door when the blood starts to flow, and that's what's going to happen here. You know. The Soviets will respond by grabbing Berlin, and then mm -hmm. people will say to me, gee, you could have avoided all of this by just exchanging those missiles in Turkey for the missiles in Cuba. He says to his aides, it sounds good to reject it now, but it's not going to sound very good after we've attacked Cuba. And what he does, because he can't resolve this with his aides, who are all, he is one against 12, 12 or 13 people at this point. He basically says, he That's basically scary. has his brother and Dean Rusk leave the room, draft a message to the Soviets which specifically points to the guarantee not to invade Cuba, and then has one sentence that kind of has a bit of innuendo that if they do this and we get through this crisis, then the other issues they've raised could be considered. And then he takes his brother aside and he says, deliver this letter to Dobrynin to give it to Khrushchev and tell Dobrynin that I will secretly take the missiles out of Turkey. Uh, and, um, hmm. and that is, in the end, how the crisis uh, is, uh, is resolved. And we should give Kennedy all the credit, not for being weak because he compromised, but for being strong to compromise and overrule mm -hmm. everybody else in the room uh, and resolve this crisis peacefully.
Well, it's a little disturbing that there were so many other voices in the room. I mean, these are these are supposedly the professionals, right? Whose job is keeping the world safe. Um, so, so were the the voices of uh, 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 the, that that sided with? Was it basically in terms of what you would consider the voices of reason? It was basically. Uh, the Kennedys, Adlai Stevenson, and maybe to some extent McNamara, and was that about it? Well, you know, out of the Cuban Missile Crisis came this designation of Hawks versus Dubs, one of the most extraordinary mm -hmm. documents that I found in Robert Kennedy's papers is his handwritten uh, kind of list in which he lines up the Hawks on one side and the Dubs on the other on the very first day of the discussion, and the discussion is gravitating around naval quarantine as an option or an airstrike as an option. And in his initial count, in which he kind of puts everybody's name under both columns, you've got the, the doves, the people who were willing to uh, uh, have the quarantine by some time, almost two to one to the, uh, to the hawks who wanted a surprise attack on mm -hmm. Cuba. But as the next two or three days progressed, that kind of shifted and the majority of Kennedy's advisors wanted an airstrike. He went ahead and decided upon a naval quarantine for a number of reasons, um, and uh, primarily because he didn't want to unleash an attack on Cuba and set off an escalation of violence between the superpowers. Um, but at the point when he made it clear that he was leaning towards buying time for a diplomatic solution, General Curtis LeMay accused him accused him of a kind of a Munich-style appeasement in front of all of his aides, which was a particularly cutting insult to President Kennedy because his father had been involved in the Munich Agreement uh, and had taken a lot mm. of historical heat from that. Uh, his father had been ambassador mm. to, to Great Britain during World War II. So, um, so uh, Kennedy, you know, uh, talks to LeMay, and LeMay is basically saying, we should attack uh, Cuba, and it's, you know, if we have to use nuclear missiles in the end, it's not a problem, because we're going to win. We have more and we're stronger. Mm -hmm. And Kennedy says to Curtis LeMay, General, you understand that if the missiles fly, 70 million Americans could be killed. We are talking about the destruction of a country. And this is something that the generals of the United States did not understand. Uh, and um, Kennedy, I think, did understand, uh -huh. and Khrushchev understood, uh, and it's... What, is, is, is LeMay's response to that on the record? Did he have <laughs> I don't believe that his response is actually there. Uh, we should say, for people who aren't familiar with Curtis LeMay, he was possibly one of the craziest people ever to achieve that kind of rank in the American yes, he was. he was a deputy <laughs> chief of staff of the U.S. Air Force. He controlled 3,000 nuclear missiles on U.S. bombing planes, U.S. bombers, and fleet of, of jets, uh, super, uh, of, of all the weapon systems uh, from the U.S. Air Force. He was cigar chomping, uh, a hero of World War uh, II. Um, uh, he was the model for the, the crazy uh, general in Stanley you know, Kubrick's uh, Dr. Strangelove, in which the kind of first right. cultural example of, 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 of kind of insanity of the nuclear era and the U.S. use of nuclear weapons and possession of nuclear weapons is depicted on film. So, it's, mm -hmm. it, but he, you, you, you know, the, the secret taping system captures a lot of what he said. Some of his words were actually used in the script of 13 Days, uh, the famous Kevin Costner movie about the missile crisis. Uh, and Kennedy basically, mm -hmm. you know, stared these guys down. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so that's so the mythology. It's true Kennedy stared someone down. What's wrong about the mythology is that it was the Soviets he stared down. The, um, uh, the, the now, in terms of the domestic politics he faced, uh, you know, he, he he wanted to keep secret the one concession, the Turkish missiles. He did. It was public. That he, right, that he had agreed not to invade Cuba. And I'm wondering, did he take some political heat even for that concession? Did some people think that this deal was was uh, was too too much, even even the public part of it? You know, the whole issue of, of what kind of agreement was arrived at became very vague and nebulous in the days following the the, the missile crisis uh, in, into November and December of 1962, um, for a variety of reasons. For for one. The Soviets 
agreement was, we'll take those missiles out of Cuba, and you can verify this by on-site inspection, and et cetera. Well, Fidel Castro was so furious at being cut out of any discussion of the solution to the missile crisis, um, and being betrayed by his own allies without even the courtesy of a phone call from Khrushchev, um, that he said, no way the United Nations or anybody else is coming on my island to inspect anything. Um, mm -hmm. And the United States was forced to figure out a way to verify the removal of these uh, missiles. And there was quite a bit of tension, even in the days and weeks following Khrushchev's announcement that he was going to pull the missiles out, because the United States didn't know how they were going to verify that the missiles were actually being removed and not hidden. Uh, they didn't trust Khrushchev to keep his word, even though they'd asked Khrushchev to trust them. Mm -hmm. um, they had had a U-2 spy plane shot down over Cuba. They did not want to send more spy planes into harm's way. Um, if the Cubans or somebody else shot down one of their planes, how were they going to retaliate without inflaming the whole situation all over again? You have, even in the first week of November, the U.S. generals giving Kennedy memos saying, if we invade Cuba, there's going to be 18,500 U.S. casualties, and that's without any use of nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. If we meet tactical nuclear weapons on the battlefield, we have no way of saying how many people will actually be killed because we've never had that experience before. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm telling you this whole history of the, in the days afterwards, Kennedy and Khrushchev kept ex exchanging these secret letters in the days following October 28th when Khrushchev announced the removal of these missiles. And those letters were kept secret for 30 years. My office was heavily engaged in getting them declassified before the 30th anniversary of the missile crisis. And they told a remarkable story of Nikita Khrushchev trying to push for a formal agreement at the United Nations where the United States would agree to an accord that the U.S. would not invade Cuba and the Soviets would agree to accord that they would never reintroduce offensive nuclear weapons into Cuba or the rest of the Western Hemisphere. And his basic argument mm -hmm. with Kennedy was, look, you and I aren't going to be leaders of our countries forever. We want this agreement to live on for our children to benefit from. The only way to make sure that that happens is to sign an international accord. And so Kennedy sent negotiators up to New York. Um, Khrushchev sent negotiators. But the truth of the matter was is that Neither Kennedy nor his aides really wanted to sign such an accord. The CIA was vociferous in pressing Kennedy not to commit to a non-invasion pledge because they wanted to continue to try and overthrow Castro. Their argument was Castro has been betrayed by his patron, the Soviet Union. There's a breach in relations with his protector. He's now at his weakest point. Now's the time to get him. Um, and you don't want to save his ass by signing some accord at the United Nations. And so the kind of the very circumstances that led to the missile crisis to begin with, the CIA was promoting extending them uh, in the aftermath of the missile crisis. And in truth, because mm -hmm. there was no verification, um, the, the United States never agreed to a formal accord. Um, they uh, kind of had helicopters and spy planes over the ships as they steamed out of out of uh, Havana Harbor and other ports in Cuba, and the, the Soviets were forced in a very humiliating way to kind of pull back the tarpaulins uh, that covered the missile parts on the top of the ship so that U.S. intelligence um, aircraft could take pictures of the missiles being removed. Um, and that uh, is the way the verification uh, took place. But in the end, there was no formal accord. It was essentially a gentleman's agreement and the United States went on trying to overthrow Castro covertly. The Soviets never did reintroduce uh, nuclear missiles uh, into Cuba. And they actually, at one point in November of 62, they were going to leave the battlefield defensive nuclear weapons that they had secretly brought to Cuba and that uh, the CIA had never really understood were there. Um, but it, because of the acrimony with Castro, they decided to pull out those missiles, those tactical battlefield weapons as well. And that story is just being told now uh, in new Soviet documents that have been pulled together by a colleague of mine at the National Security Archive, a book on Mikoyan, Anastas Mikoyan, Khrushchev and Castro, and the withdrawal of the missiles from, uh, mm -hmm. from, the, from, from Cuba. Okay. Well, uh, we're running out of time, but I'm, I, I wanted to give you a chance uh, to say anything you want to say about 
contemporary Cuba, um, especially in the context of the legacy of this whole thing, I mean, for example, our perceptions of the United States in Cuba still colored by this whole thing? I mean, I would think maybe the Bay of Pigs looms a little larger in the Cuban memory than this in, in terms of Cuba's relationship with America, but I don't know. I mean, what what is your take on that? Well, my, my take is that uh, the, the early history of U.S.-Cuban relations, including the Bay of Pigs, Operation Mongoose, and the Missile Crisis, are all very influential in current uh, U.S.-Cuban uh, relations. Certainly, the Cubans remember the threat very well. For them, you know, they were on the edge of a precipice, not of nuclear war with uh, between the superpowers, but of a massive attack, uh, a week of carpet bombing and a full-scale U.S. invasion of over 100,000 uh, U.S. troops um, during the missile crisis. And so it was an incredibly intense time for them that they ironically survived. Um, Castro went on to be the one leader of the three leaders of the Cuban Missile Crisis to, 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 to survive and thrive and, and see his revolution go forward for decades, whereas we all know that sadly John Kennedy was assassinated and Nikita Khrushchev was purged from power um, two years later. So it has a great influence. Um, the, the real situation, I think, for today is that so much has changed. The international circumstances have changed. The Soviet Union is no longer, there's no longer an issue of Cuba being a base of another superpower. And yet, for domestic political reasons, and mostly the anti-Castro vote in Florida, which once again in this election uh, will certainly be in, in play, um, has, mm -hmm. has really kept U.S. presidents from exercising kind of the wisdom that John Kennedy uh, exercised towards accommodation, dialogue, and some type of compromise with the Cuban Revolution. Cuban Revolution doesn't really have any threat to us. And that's part of why we've had the luxury of continuing to push it away and not deal with it for domestic political reasons. But really, the, the world would be safer uh, and a lot more uh, kind of regular, if you will, if U.S. policy would come into the 21st century uh, and simply accept the Cuban Revolution with its aging communist leaders uh, as we have accepted the communist leaders of China and Putin and the Soviet Union and and, 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 and other countries as well that we don't agree with. Um, we can mm -hmm. have peaceful relations with Cuba. Raul Castro took the opportunity of the 50th anniversary of the Missile Crisis to once again reiterate that Cuba is interested in a dialogue with the Soviet Union. Uh, I'm sorry, Raul uh, Castro took this opportunity of the 50th anniversary to, uh, to say again, as he has many times, that Cuba is interested in a dialogue with Washington to resolve these outstanding differences, which are very different now from the issues were, that were at play uh, during the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. The issues that John Kennedy put to Fidel Castro in 1962 and 63 about uh, coexistence, they're no longer relevant. And in some ways, we should just go ahead and normalize relations, name an ambassador to Cuba and let Cuba have a full-fledged embassy here in Washington. Um, and at this point, the rest of the world is like scratching their head about why this kind of Cold War era anomaly, anomaly in U.S. foreign policy continues to exist. Yeah. Yeah, it is, it doesn't seem to me to have been a very productive policy. I mean, I think, well, not that I'm an expert, but I think uh, if we had had economic engagement for the last few decades, Cuba would probably be the 51st state by now. But, um, but be that no, as it no, may, no, thank no, you no. so much. Cuba would never have been the 51st uh, state. That's an exaggerate. That, that's and like in fact, for that intention of, of the United States in the 1800s is precisely what created a Cuban nationalism <laughs> uh, that led to the Cuban Revolution to begin with. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I was, so uh, Cuba is going to be an independent country. Cuba is going to be an independent yeah. country, but it wants the respect and recognition as such. And that is essentially all it will take for the United States to have normal relations with Cuba. Right. Uh, that and for Florida to cease to be a, a swing That's state. exactly true. Uh, well, I mean, exactly true. I mean, the latter is a prerequisite for the former, possibly. That's exactly true. Uh, okay. Well, thanks so much, Peter, uh, for all this. It's been fascinating. And thanks for your ongoing efforts to uh, open up, you know, as much of history as possible for our uh, analysis and comprehension. Um, and... Uh, 
good luck with your book. Uh, what's what's the name of it going to be again? Talking with Castro: The Untold History of Dialogue with Between Wash Between the United States and Cuba. And it comes out when? Yeah, hopefully next year. Okay. Well, we'll pre-order as soon as that's possible. Thanks All again. Right, bye now. Okay.